topic we're going to talk about right now actually is a nice segue from the previous session, as well as the session before that, BNPL, um, and also are there going to be cards or no cards. Our thesis says that you're going to have a million plus cards uh, for each one of your banks or financial institutions because we think there's going to be an interesting sort of dynamic as digital starts to take hold of where the market is. Now, I do have a bit of a problem because I was expecting a clicker, but I don't have a clicker in my hand, so I can't move the slides forward. So if somebody can just give me a clicker, that would be great. So, um, um, like I said, my name is Gary Singh. I am uh, with Zeta, and uh, I'm the president of the company. We've been here for only about nine months. Uh, in terms of uh, post-stealth mode, we, we launched our company at Money 2020 last year. So really excited to be here today. So some stats I think you're really, really you know, aware of, you're, you're, you know, what's happening in the industry, but sometimes putting a number to it to refresh yourself is al always a good thing. So 33 trillion, right? That's the spending power of the Gen Z. We all know the Gen Z uh, uh, industry, we all have talked about it, but I would argue at this point that nobody's really serving them. I will also argue with the fact that nobody's really done a good job with the millennials as well especially when it comes to financial services, which is why all the fintechs exist today, right? If there was no such, the fintechs have seen an opportunity to basically capitalize on understanding how the market is shifting and how you can use technology and other methods using digital as the front, uh, forefront to drive fundamentally new paradigms in the marketplace, which in the financial industry market, uh, you know, we've sort of, sort of missed the mark at this point. So big, big, big opportunity, uh, obviously, and you have to start early uh, from a strategy perspective. Why is this important? Like, and I think you probably went to a lot of different sessions talking about you know, how Gen Z is different, and some of you probably have Gen Zs in your house. Some are actually working um, at this point. Uh, I have two nephews who are working at Amazon at this point, and uh, both of them don't own a car. They have no plans to own a car. That's not in their DNA at this point, and they resisted it. My daughter's 19, same thing. She doesn't want to own a car. She doesn't see the need for owning a car. Doesn't even want to get a driver's license. And why is that? Because digital has changed their life. They don't need a car anymore. They don't need gas anymore, right? The fundamental shift is happening in front of us, and, and we need to recognize those shifts in the marketplace to fundamentally understand how are we going to sell financial services to this category that fundamentally is so disruptive in, in terms of how they think about, um, think about uh, spending money and where they want to spend the money. Um, obviously, we, we know about the grocery shopping. The pandemic definitely accelerated that. People don't want to go to the stores anymore. You know, we order food at home. And I'll give you a funny example of the food, you know, how people are getting a little bit caught up in that. And this is pre-pandemic, by the way. A very good friend of mine, of mine is a millennial, lives in San Francisco. And I went to his house for dinner one night, and uh, he says, Gary, I got, I'm going to order the best stuff in, in the city today. I'm like, how are you going to do that? We're going to eat the dinner at the house. He says, I'm going to order my best dishes from three different restaurants. I said, great. So he orders the three different dishes. Of course, the three dishes, dishes come over to the house. And I said, by the way, didn't you mention that you're really into climate control and uh, climate, uh, what's happening with the climate uh, in, the, uh, in, in the world? He said, yes. I guess you just used three cars to deliver your food. That's three times the gas you burned to get these three dishes to the, uh, to the table. But anyways, interesting things happening in terms of the shift in what's happening in the industry. Uh, you know, for hotel travels, you know, I don't think the last time I can remember when I went on a vacation and I went to actually a hotel. Every room looks the same, right? There's no diversity in those, uh, in those areas. Obviously, we're here because it's a conference, but on a personal uh, front, I don't think I can remember the last time I spent money in a hotel. It's always VRBOs or Airbnb, and I'm not even part of that generation at this point. And then, of course, how you consume media. You know all this stuff, right? We all know all this stuff. However, we also know that nothing really has changed in terms of how we serve these customers or these segments of the marketplace. You know, you've seen the industry sort of evolve over the last 20 plus years, and that acceleration just continues, right? There's so many different iPhones that have come since it was launched in 2007 to early 2021. But if you look at the fundamentals of a credit card, they haven't shifted much. Now we can talk about NFC and we can talk about you know, things like it's contactless, but that doesn't drive something meaningfully different for the consumer. If, as a matter of fact, we just talk about the behavior hasn't changed because there's still friction 
uh, from acceptance perspective or actually the act of using a wallet or the act of fundamentally pulling out your phone versus the, the card, et cetera. So we really haven't seen any innovation there, and there is a reason for that, obviously. And the reason for that is we're stuck in really a whole bunch of you know, legacy tech that doesn't allow itself to deliver you know, cards at scale in a digital environment. So this is fundamentally what's happening in our industry. We, t we try to compete on the basis of rewards and fees, and that's about it. You know, FIA and FI10 fundamentally have the same product. And if you look at their websites, you may have two cards or maybe you have seven cards. You know, it's fundamentally a challenge to basically serve a market that doesn't care about this model anymore. And, and you have to think differently in terms of how you can basically drive a certain level of innovation that has been stuck for the last 30 years uh, in terms of the plastic and the fundamentals of the plastic uh, in the industry. So um, changing the status quo and embarking on a new journey, if you really want to think about serving not only the Gen Z and the millennials, but also Gen Xs, which is where I sit. And I will tell you out of uh, you know, some of my personality traits, um, I don't think I've gone to an ATM in the last eight years. This is a fact. I have not carried cash for the last eight years. Stopped doing it because I don't see a need for it. And I think it's pretty much true for most people at this point, but there's a lot of people still doing it because they don't understand why they don't need to carry cash. I live my life, I travel all over the world, but never to ever have I carried a single dollar in my pocket uh, over the last eight years. I've also not written a check in the last eight years. And, uh, and that's also interesting, although my wife has written some checks in certain unique cases, and I can't even find a checkbook if I have to go look for one. So you can do business today, you know, and you can transact without check and cash. However, we've just not provided the right set of tools and services to the market to fundamentally eliminate that. We believe the answer to this is hyper-personalization. This is something that has not been possible until recently. And the reason for that is because our tech technology stacks have been so, you know, uh, I would say archaic at this point, and I think most of you have gone through those pains. You know, we talk about conversions, you know, sort of uh, 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 pains and the cost of switching, et cetera, but after you switch, it's pretty much the same old, same old stuff. There's nothing fundamentally that's changed uh, in our industry uh, from that perspective, but we think that if you really personalize your products, and rather than having seven credit cards, maybe have infinite number of credit cards based on behaviors and psychographics of the users you're trying to serve. You know, my daughter tried to apply, and you know, we're talking still 2022 at this point. She, went to, she started school last year in college, and I thought the fintechs had made it. She applied at Chime, she applied at Discover, and she applied at another uh, 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 provider, and she was rejected, not a credit card, I'm talking a debit card. She was rejected at all three, and nobody has the time to call them back and say, hey, why did you reject my debit card at this point? So technology is still not working even in 2022, even though there's a lot of success happening in the marketplace. So we, f we feel that hyper-personalization is the answer. However, the technology is not there today uh, in terms of delivering a very specific use case to a specific person at the time of their transaction or before the transaction or after the transaction. There are certain things coming into play that we'll see, but definitely there's a lot of things that, that need to be addressed. So what are the personalization building blocks? And this is the shift that's happening from a banking tech stack. Until this point, these were all, you know, they're still legacy systems as we like to call it. You don't really have the right set of data available to think about personalization. You definitely have some data to understand card behavior, but you really don't have enough data in the right planner form to decide to say, hey, if I have 100,000 sort of customers, can I have 100,000 sub-segmentation for those, for those customers? And what is the right sort of uh, you know, service that I wanna offer to them based on who they are and what they do? It's not possible today, but with data, it is possible. The fundamental secular thing that needs to be addressed for that is your systems have to be in the cloud. So you can really mine the power of the cloud to drive the analytics, to drive the data that you really need to use to create these hyperly uh, personalized experiences. Second thing which is unique about this is real time. Everything has to be real time in today's world. So when you talk about psychographics and things like that, you don't think just about when you're going home from, from work, 
you, you know, there are certain people who are spontaneous. They basically just need to buy a meal on the way, and they'll pick anything that they want, that they can spontaneously attract them. Some people are emotional in their thinking. They think about, you know, I had a tough day at work, so I need some kind of comfort food today. Some people are going to be more structured in the sense that they have a, they ate something for lunch, so they're going to go pick something else on that particular day. So same thing can apply to financial services. You know, everything doesn't have to look exactly the same for everybody that you're serving in the marketplace. So real time really plays a big role in that. So far, all our products were created at a time in, time in your, your product strategy, and they stay like that for the rest of their journey. I've never seen a you know, credit card basically evolve into something different. It's always the same credit card for the, for the last 20, 10, 15 years. Um, there have to be contextual, so that goes without saying. So what's the right use, you know, value proposition you want to deliver? At the, at the moment of truth or in the moment that matters to that person? So thinking about somebody who's a Gen Z who may have just, okay, maybe a millennial at this point, who has just bought a house. So when they have a credit card, what type of thinking do you want to apply to that person that they've just used all their savings to go buy that house at this point, and now they have to think about you know, buying some furniture and other things. Do you really want to charge them the 18 or 20 percent APR, or do you want to think about BNPL? How do you infuse those things into the, into the conversation? And then finally, it comes down to ecosystems. You can't do this alone. You have to marry this with other surround services, whether it's insurance, whether it's automobile, servicing, and all the merchant ecosystems, delivery uh, ecosystems. So you have to infuse your products with multiple different entities to make that happen. That's where the building blocks come into play. And until this point, you cannot do this today. You cannot do this today because you're stuck on legacy stacks. That's the reason for that. So we think that there's a number of different things. This is just a starting point for this conversation, uh, the way we like to talk about it. That from a card program perspective, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say will s sound obvious to you, but when you take that information and you uh, try to personalize it from a uh, segmentation perspective, it becomes impossible. You just can't think about how to take a program and make it into a personalized program. So you start with data, so that's number one. So how do you basically start to use the data, not only at the user level, but at the aggregate level? Structured and unstructured data, and if most of you uh, here have seen over the last three to five years, the big thing from a consumer experience is data enrichment, right? Clean the merchant data and then enrich it. And that is a big project by itself, but why? Why is that not part of the technology stack? Why do you have to make that special effort to clean the merchant data, right? And you invest money into it, and then you don't really clearly see what the value proposition is on the other end, because you're still having to deal with another separate system that is not fully in integrated into your payments uh, platform, so to speak. So these are disparate products that, you know, just like your debit and credit programs don't talk to each other, your credit program and data enrichment, yes, they're integrated, but are they driving the right experiences for your customers when you connect that, those two, two elements uh, together? Next one is form factor. I think in the previous conversation they talked about is at the end of the card. We think there's so many possibilities by going digital. And I think the underlying technology on the form factor will be the virtual card. And we think you can create one too many relationships, whether it's a one-time transaction or whether it's a family distribution, whether it's a small, you know, in the gigster economy, whether you have you know, a, 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 a temporary or small business owner who's just started to do delivery services, and they bring in temporary workers, and they create virtual cards to deliver those services to those, to those uh, delivery drivers and they use gas to pump into their cars. Not a fleet card, very cumbersome, very expensive. You're not gonna serve somebody with, you know, who's got an independently owned operator with five or seven drivers who change rapidly with a fleet card. That's not gonna work. So there's form factors gonna play a big role in that. Uh, configurations, this is the power of the technology today. The configuration, what, what we mean by that is product configurations. So it's impossible to create 100 different products for your audiences let alone create two or five, because each one of them becomes a massive project for you. you. We believe that flexible configuration where you understand the dynamics of your seg, uh, sub-segmentation, so you take the ma macro level segmentation and sub-segmentation, and then massively create these, I would call it a product factory, so you can serve each one of them through a digital mechanism. The plastic will always be there. We're, we're not saying it's gonna replace the plastic, but 
taking it to the next level through digital, you know, harness that power as you go forward. And then card behavior. So how does a card actually perform? Is it a one-time use? It? Is it a multiple, multiple time use? It? Use? Is it going to be a certain uh, you know, spend limits based on the type of virtual cards you're creating? Or other, it could be a QR code for that matter for a certain transaction. We were at a very large entity recently, and one of the things they shared with us was you know, they, they approve people, pre-approve people on auto loans. And then these folks basically are running around with their checks to the, uh, to the dealerships. And there's this ver verification of the whole process that is very cumbersome using fax machines, et cetera. Why not just give them a virtual credit card? They can go to the, they can go to the dealer and just, just use that virtual card to buy a car. That's totally possible. Then you'll talk about, okay, there's interchange fees, et cetera. You can solve those problems through a digital mechanism. Do, uh, give a refund to the customer for the interchange transactions that may have occurred. Because at the end of the day, you're making the money on, on the interest rates, not necessarily on the interchange on that. So there's many, many different ways to think about using these cards for other use cases uh, that we haven't thought about. And finally, the ecosystem. Who are the other people who are going to play a role in personalizing this experience or this use case? This becomes partnering with merchants, partnering with other service providers, especially digital providers, and really creating a, 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 a new paradigms of, of products that you're going to basically personalize. Maybe you won't do, if you have 100,000 accounts, maybe you won't do 100,000 different products. Maybe you'll do at least maybe 100. Maybe it's 1,000. But that possibility should be available to you so that you can serve your market and retain that market as you go forward. And of course, the partners come into play. It doesn't matter if you're a community bank or a small credit union or a large bank. You have the ability to partner at the local level or at the, at the national level to drive better experiences and better personalization of the products. So data, we believe, is in three categories. So it comes down to capturing all the data across the life cycle of the users and at the macro level and doing even crowdsourcing to some extent. It has to have real-time access of this data, so you're making these decisions in real time to influence the, uh, the personalization of the product. And then finally, the analysis of this data, structured and unstructured data, to, decide, to define you know, the value propositions in the card's life cycle, the, the human being who's using that card as they go. It's not going to stay static for the rest of their life. They start in a, in a new job. They basically get married. Your card has to change. That experience has to change as you go from being the first time you know, as an intern to getting into the first job all the way into you know, retirement, if you will. If you will, it can't be the same card for those 40 plus years. So on the form factor, we think that it's, anything is possible. You can go all the way from virtual cards to variables to XPay wallets, tokenized cards, physical cards. All of these basically are allowing you to personalize not only at the specific form factor level, but also at the time of transaction. And certain cards you want to use for virtual capabilities. Certain cards you want to use for the physical capabilities. Certain cards you want to do, you know, instead of tap and pay, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a uh, scanner-based solution, which is very effective as well, QR codes. We all use QR codes every single day for those of you who go to Starbucks. Very, very quick and efficient way of making a transaction. So think about those things in terms of personalizing those capabilities based on the transaction side. And flexible and dyna dynamic configuration. This is the heart of personalization at the end of the day. All these things that you see when you create a new card program is something you do. But it takes you six months, nine months, sometimes a year to come up with these elements. And then you launch the product, and then that product never changes. We believe that if you have a product factory, you, can con you basically dynamically and flexibly, on the fly, basically build new programs and new products. You don't need your processor. You don't need your technology provider to sit down with you and create a six-month project for you. You can do this in a day if you think about it the right way and personalize it to that level. That's where we believe the technology needs to be to really think about how the other industries have been disrupted. This is a super exciting time for all of us. Financial services is going to look very different in the next 10 to 15 years. We know everything that's been going around in the VC industry, everything we, that's going around with the fintechs, banks, credit unions, all of you are innovating every single day. And it's going to look different. And we feel that personalization is going to play a huge role in who's going to win and who's going to lose uh, as this disruption continues. 
Card behavior, a lot of you are used to card controls, but you have to think differently about them as you go forward. It's not just about turning the card on off. It's really about how you distribute those services with a family member who starts with the, on the primary account holder. I have four virtual cards for my family. You don't have to get involved in that. You're giving the power back to the, uh, to the account holder. And, and then the account holder understands their you know, uh, family better than, uh, than you will, and they're able to offer them a customized, personalized virtual card or a physical card the way they want to define it, not how you want to define it. So card behavior and the controls, it could go into fleet, it could go to small businesses. All of that is possible as you go into the modern era of, uh, of digitization. So finally, it comes to rewards and offers. This is the anchor of loyalty in a card program. We believe that this, again, also doesn't have to be a very static approach. I give you 2% back, or I give you five points per dollar spent. We feel that these rewards should be changing on a daily basis. You have to think about you know, how do you basically interact with digital providers who want to serve your market. Right? You're fundamentally, once you have a mobile app, and a presence in the market, in the hands of a consumer, you are a publisher. So might as well leverage that and think about you know, how to basically allow others to add value to your program. Now, I'm not trying to say you're monetizing the customer. You can, of course you can do that. It's really about how to add more value to the consumer so that they start to think about uh, you know, that this is the program that I want to stay uh, with because it understands my needs. Simple example here. You buy a new car. Well, guess what? You're going to need insurance. So why not integrate with some digital provider? There's a lot of those, and you'll see this. The fintechs do this all day these days. Every single fintech offers insurance services as part of their card program. Why can't you do that as well? If you're a fintech, let's go take it to the next level. So you know those things are super important. Real-time communication at the time of that decision has to be important. And then finally, flexible APIs to make this whole program really effective uh, in the marketplace. So there's a whole bunch of stuff behind there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. So finally, context, context, right? So context is all about before, during, and after a transaction is taking place. How are you really engaging with your customers uh, and the cardholders during those transactions? Does it have to be a virtual card? Does it have to be a physical card? Should it be a QR code? Should it be a, a, a loaded, uh, separate BNPL category for them to go buy furniture? Should it be basically buying a car? Right? All those things sort of come into place in terms of where the transaction is happening, what is the transaction for, when is that transaction happening, and how is that transaction happening. That's a personalized way of thinking about a cardholder's journey during a transaction, uh, before, during, and after a transaction. Here's a quick, simple example, right? Contextual BNPL. Somebody just made a transaction of 200 bucks at Amazon. You send them a, a notification, instant notification, understanding the data understanding the customer b beforehand, and you can convert that into a loan product. This is BNPL here, basically. So you can compete with the BNPL players. And with one click, you've just fundamentally changed the, the dynamic, meaning that that user, that millennial or Gen Z, or even myself, if they want to take advantage of that, they can do that in seconds. And you don't have to create a new product for that to happen. So this is a quick, simple example that we thought we would resonate especially when you talked about the, the session before and the session before that. Um, ecosystems really comes down to distribution mechanisms. We think about this in two, two ways. One is distribution for acquisition, embedded banking, and the other is to deliver value, so delivery mechanisms. So how do you bring in into your ecosystem other players that will help you create a better experience or a personal experience for your cardholders? New use cases, those are the new revenue generation uh, elements or just pure value creation for your cardholders. If they spend more, everybody's happy. If they uh, you know, revolve more, uh, uh, everybody's happy. And then customer experiences, right? Tools and capabilities. So those are the ecosystems that you have to think about in personalization, and all of this is starting to be possible in the marketplace. So when you think about creating a personalized use cases, you think about yourself as a financial institution. You're creating these programs or cards you know, as a product factory. Uh, you start to work with what we would call as delivery partners. These are the ones that enhance that value to the consumer, right? So think of this, what would be in the old days, a co-brand program. We think that's going to die very fast. It's already dying to some extent. 
and it's going to die even faster because it's very, very limited with one particular merchant. So you, think, you start to think about local, and you start to think uh, national as well. And, and these delivery partners, it could be an insurance company, it could be anything you can imagine uh, that is specific to your community bank, to your bank, to your credit union. It's up to you. It's your imagination that that's comes into play. And there's acquisition partners to expand your base, to basically go after new customer segments and or grow your existing segments. And the combination of the three is the cardholder value creation. And that's how you start to think about personalization um, at scale uh, using modern technologies in the marketplace. And how you do that is a high level architecture I wanted to share with you. We have a concept called virtual bank operators and it's all 100% API based. So you think from all the way across from product setup to sending and receiving money on the card, you have issuer APIs and you can segment those APIs by your partners. And then finally, you can go into open APIs for the consumers. This is where the distribution partner comes into play or your acquisition partners come, to, come into play. So allowing you to create more value for your cardholders and really starting to differentiate yourself. So I already talked about this. What's preventing you from doing this today? It's your technology. It's outdated. That's a matter of fact. I think you know it. I think everybody knows that. And, uh, and if you don't change that rapidly, it's going to become difficult. You become the blockbuster of you know, net, Netflix uh, from what happened in that industry. So product rigidity is definitely one of those things. You know, one size fits all. Um, ability to manage partners, you don't know how to do that because the technology providers don't enable you to do that. And if you want to do anything with a partner, it costs you a lot of money to make that happen. So these are impediments to you to deliver these values to your consumers. Advantages are obvious, right? Differentiated value proposition. You can really start to think about what is meaningful to you guys. Stickiness, multiple customer segments. Of course, top of wallet and all that sort of good stuff goes along with that. And really understanding your customers. And that's where the moat comes in. So they're going to stay with you for the next 40 years and not have five cards in their pocket uh, and try to decide which one they're going to pick. And finally, the impact is significant. This is a, this is a research that came out of a Deloitte. Um, and uh, 2020 uh, in terms of the impact of personalization. It starts with looking backwards in terms of, you know, what can you do uh, to your cardholders, you know, which is sending a, you know, a, an email to them to do this, that, and the other. Field insertions, so, you know, basically saying, hey, you just did that, maybe you want to try this. Uh, and then you basically go into aggregation, segmentation, et cetera. That's all sort of reactive. But now you can start to think about being proactive which goes along with behavioral recommendations. And personalization comes as part of that. Omnichannel optimization. You know, how is the cardholder using the, the spend? How are you acquiring them, et cetera? And then predictive personalization. You're predicting the approach so that the technology is personalizing it for you uh, in terms of the cardholder uh, uh, journey, so to speak, and their long-term uh, relationship with you. So how do you basically make that happen? This is, a, this is like I said, you know, we're re relatively young. Just came out of stealth mode last year in money 2020. Um, and we just redesigned the whole architecture to de deliver what we call as a product factory. At the base level is our data, so that's the cloud layer. At the next level up is the intelligence, so basically create any type of product in a matter of you know, days and weeks. Um, and then on the top level is the interaction with the ecosystem. That's a consumer or a partner. So that's kind of you know, what we do. We would love to tell you more about this. We're here today. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, we have a small little booth at the back end. Uh, we're also sponsoring the evening cocktail, so we'd love to see you guys there. So with that, I'll take any questions if you guys have. If, if not, think about personalization uh, and how it can really fundamentally change your financial institution, starting with credit cards, perhaps, as an experiment, and then moving into other assets and liabilities products. We think the whole thing is going to come together, which is why you see that purple box is fundamentally a product that does both assets and liabilities. So you can do revolving credit, you can do BNPL, you can do prepaid, you can do debit, um, and you can do loan products, et cetera. And we think that level of very tight integration is what enables you to deliver personalization at scale without you know, uh, breaking the bank, so to speak. So with that, I'll, uh, I have like 30 seconds for some questions. If not, we're going to be outside. Uh, taking more questions and helping uh, explain who we are all about. So thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate your time today and look forward to uh, spending some more time with you. Uh